Uh, and now on to the fourth speaker of the afternoon, uh, who is Jose Miguel Hernandez Lobato, who's a lecturer in machine learning at the Department of Engineering of the University of Cambridge, and of course, a Turing Fellow. And in a way, I think maybe this is kind of going to look back over all the stuff we've heard about today, because it's about uh, how do you actually make sure that this stuff is works and stands up. The talk, the talk title I've been given, although on this afternoon's basis, you've probably updated it to something completely different. But what I'm expecting is probabilistic methods for increased robustness in machine learning. Jose, whatever you're going to talk about, talk about it now. Good. Uh, thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks for the uh, for inviting me to give this uh, presentation. Uh, today I'm going to talk about some of the latest uh, research done in my group. And uh, this is uh, some of the work that I have been doing in collaboration with some of my students. Uh, and uh, the idea is to come up with methods that are going to be robust. Uh, the challenge that we address here is that in some uh, settings, Sometimes uh, deep learning methods, they fail catastrophically. And uh, the reason for this is that they uh, pick up spurious dependencies between input uh, features and the target variables. And uh, I'm going to show next uh, an example of this, uh, but this type of spurious dependencies are pre preventing the application of these methods in many settings where it's critical that deep learning methods uh, work well. For, for example, in healthcare or uh, in self-driving cars uh, and so on. Uh, so how do we solve this problem? The idea is to use a causal representation learning. We're going to follow a causal approach. And instead of uh, making predictions using uh, all the input features, we're going to uh, estimate some latent variables that generate the data. And we're, we're going to use only the causal latent variables uh, to make predictions. And that's, it, that's going to result in, in robust predictions because we use only those, those causal latent variables. So what do I mean by these spurious features? Uh, what happens is that deep learning, as shown here in the left, uh, you have now several input uh, variables shown on the top as these uh, light squares, and you're using them to predict uh, a target variable. Uh, so the target variable could, could be the class of a particular image, if it is a dog or a wolf, and then the features could be the pixels in the image. Uh, when you try to solve this problem, deep learning is capturing all the possible dependencies between input features and the label. And it could be that uh, there are some spurious dependencies. As uh, for example, in this example here that I show in the right, the problem is to classify images of uh, wolves and dogs. And uh, it happens that all the wolves uh, have uh, more frequently snow in the background. The background is white with the snow for the images with wolves. And the deep learning methods, they learn to pick up on these spurious uh, features or spurious dependencies between the background pixels and the target class. And this is shown here in this example, when you explain the prediction of a classifier that tries to classify this image, it's an image of a dog, but it's classified incorrectly as a wolf because there is snow in the background. And the, the prediction of the method is, if you try to explain why the network believes that this is a wolf, uh, we see that it's uh, looking at the pixels in the background, the, the snow instead of the shape of the animal. So we want to avoid this type of spurious features. And uh, what we follow here is a um, latent variable, a causal latent variable approach. The idea is that we're going to have the data as uh, shown here on the left. We're going to then uh, estimate uh, some latent variables shown here on the top, slightly uh, in pink color. These latent variables are going to explain how the data is generated. And uh, we have here now some arrows that represent the causal uh, connections between variables. And we see that some latent variables, they are the causes of the label. It could be that these latent variables, they represent the shape of the animal that appears in the image. And obviously, they uh, determine some of the pixels in the image. That's why we have also connections between the top uh, latent variables and the uh, pixels that are shown in the middle. And some of the latent variables are actually effects of the label. It could be, for example, the pixels in the background. No, because the picture is a picture of a wolf. Uh, maybe it's more likely that there is like a snow in the background. And we see that there is this top uh, latent variable on the right that is uh, has an arrow from the class label uh, pointing to it, and it's an effect. 
So when we want to make a, a robust predictions and don't build on the spurious features like those in the background, we're going to use those latent variables as the, the two that are shown on the, on the right with the red arrows pointing down, those are the causal latent variables that explain how the data is uh, generated. That they, they explain the, the, the target variable, they generate the shape of the animal. And we're going to use those to make predictions. So the question is, how do we get this to work in practice? How we can guarantee recovery of the true latent variables? And how can we discover which ones are the what ones causing the target? So to guarantee recovery of the latent variables, we propose a new generative model, uh, which is identifiable. Uh, this is a deep generative model. It's similar to a, a generative adversarial network. For example, a generator in a GAN is going to generate a, a structured high dimensional data from some low dimensional uh, latent variables. And what we have is that this model is guaranteed to recover the original latent variables that we are used to generate the data up to simple transformations. And this is shown in this uh, example here. On the top left, we have the original latent variables shown with different colors. And uh, we see then the, the values of the latent variables recovered with different uh, methods. And we see that, in general, there is an overlap between the different variables because those mod models are not identifiable. But our model, which is this uh, NFIVAE, it's a non-factorized uh, identifiable variation of the other model, is able to identify these uh, latent variables. And when we look at the correlation between the latent variables uh, recovered by our method and the uh, original ones, uh, we see that our method has like a very high degree of correlation, indicating that we are able to recover the original latent variables uh, up to simple transformations, like linear, linear transformations of the variables. So this is great. We can do that. And then uh, the question is, once we have identified or estimated the true latent variables that generated the data, the question is to identify the ones or discover which ones cause the target. And it turns out that for any two latent variables, which are these uh, x uh, variables here, these are the latent variables uh, recovered by the method. For any two latent variables, you can have that either both cause the target y, so they have arrows pointing to y, or one uh, is a cause and the other one is an effect. So you have one that points to y and the other one uh, receives an arrow from y. Or you have that both are effects and you have that uh, both receives uh, receive arrows from y, indicating that they are effects. So these are the only three possible cases. And it turns out that only in the case where both are causes, the one on the left, you have that the two variables become uh, dependent when you condition on y. There is like a, an increase in the dependence between those variables. This makes sense if you think about uh, two numbers and you, you sum two numbers, for example, number uh, a and b, and I tell you the result is uh, the result of that sum is c. So if I tell you the result of the sum, if you know one of the numbers, then you immediately know the other one. No. So conditioning on y, if y is the sum of the two latent variables, conditioning on y already introduces some dependence, no? because whenever you know one of the values of the latent variable, you, know, you need the, to know the other one right away, no? because both have to sum up to y. So conditioning on y introduces dependencies. And we can then do tests for conditional dependence and find when you condition to, for two, two latent variables, when you condition on y, you have that the, the amount of dependence increases. So we tested this in different uh, settings. A very simple setting is uh, our benchmark is called color MNIST. And the idea is just to classify digits. You classify the digits into classes uh, from 0 to 4 and from uh, 5 to 9. And uh, the challenge here is that the digits have colors, and the colors are highly correlated with the label. No? So the digits uh, that are from 0 to 5 typically have one color, and the digits that are from 5 to six uh, have uh, typically another color. Uh, and uh, the problem is very challenging. Typically, most methods, the standard methods, they will do very poorly. Like, for example, this uh, empirical risk minimization here, it's a typical method for making predictions. The accuracy is 10% only because it just uh, uh, builds on this color. And at test time, the color is not informative. Actually, at test time, the color is uh, completely anti-correlated with the, with the labels. So if you have a classifier that uses the color to make predictions, it's going to do very poorly here. And we see that our method actually does uh, very well, almost as uh, close as uh, a ground uh, 
a, a ground truth uh, model that doesn't uh, see the color. And again, we see that our model is identifiable in this case. We can also intervene in the, the causal latent variables that we see and they are shown here in these two rows. We have a row of an eight that uh, changes the color and then a three that also changes the color. Uh, those are latent variables that are the effect of uh, the label Y. And then they are not causal, they are just the uh, latent variables that are the effect and they are not useful for prediction. And we see that the model is actually identifying that those latent variables are just associated with the color of the images and they are not useful for making predictions. While if we change other latent variables which are causal, uh, the shape of the digit changes, which is what we see in the top rows here. The five changes to an eight and the nine changes to a three. So this shows that this works in practice. We tested it on a, a more challenging benchmark. This is a real world problem. You have now uh, data from th four different uh, data sets uh, shown here, Caltech, uh, Label Me, Sun, and uh, Vogue. They are different image data sets with uh, images of birds, cars, chairs, dogs, and people. And uh, they all have the same categories, but the characteristics of the images in each data set are different. And when you train on three data sets, on data from three data sets and make predictions on a fourth one, then performance typically is not as good. And what we see is that our method uh, does uh, much better than other baselines in this case, because it's making more robust predictions. Another interesting application of this method has been in uh, molecular design. Um, we apply deep generative models to uh, come up with new improved molecules. And the idea is to have a generative model that maps molecule to, molecules to a latent space. This is a continuous low dimensional latent space. Uh, and we have a predictor that makes uh, predictions about, about molecular properties from this latent space. And you can then do molecular optimization by uh, making, taking steps in, the, in this latent space in directions that improve the, the predictions of the, of the, for the molecular properties. So what we do is now use this uh, identifiable VAEs uh, that I have described. And then we find which latent variables are actually the cause of the target property in the molecule. And we use only those latent variables for optimization. And we see that here as a function of the number of uh, data evaluations of the properties of molecules, we collect here data for about 500 new molecules. And we see that uh, our method that uses these causal uh, latent variables uh, performs much better. So to conclude, uh, this uh, technology is uh, really exciting. It's, uh, it's using new ad advances in identifiable deep generative models uh, together with uh, methods for identifying causal uh, variables. And uh, we think this has uh, interesting uh, applications in any settings where you need to make uh, accurate predictions that are robust. And this could be, for example, in healthcare, if, if you have data from different hospitals, uh, you want to make maybe uh, robust predictions on uh, data that comes from a new hospital for which uh, the model has not been trained before. Uh, it can be also used in many different real world applications uh, where you may you need to make these uh, robust predictions uh, for example uh, customer turn loan defaulting uh, we have seen these applications in molecular property prediction as well and uh, just to conclude just to point out that there is still one limitation in this method and this is that it requires uh, identifiability of the latent uh, variable model and this requires uh, enough diversity in your data to guarantee this identifiability so that's all. Thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, I will be happy to uh, answer any questions that you may have. That's great. Thank you very much, Jose. We do have a, a couple of questions in. Uh, the first one is a little tongue in cheek, but I think it's a, a kind of also a serious question. Uh, somebody has said, well, how big a problem is the, the wolf problem? Because uh, they could look at it as a human and see that it was obviously a wolf and not a dog. Uh, so why is that wolf example? Because I think that was a real world case, wasn't it? Where a uh, yeah, so, learning model was was given the task of distinguishing and went, well, these are the wolves. And then uh, exactly as you showed, it, it turned out that what they were using to predict it was not at all the shape of the of the animal, but the fact that the wolves were in the snow. Why, why is that an important example? I mean, this is an, an example because it's clearly illustrative and it's simple to understand. But you have to know that uh, deep learning is used to make predictions in all sorts of very complicated problems. And uh, in this type of problems, uh, there could be these spurious uh, features and you may not really be aware of this. 
And the, the example is with the uh, data from different hospitals. No, you could have like data from two different hospitals and uh, you train your classifier and you say, oh, I'm, I evaluate my classifier in, the, in data from these two hospitals and it actually works great. And then I actually get new data from another hospital that is slightly different and it presents a uh, unique uh, variations and then your classifier fails uh, catastrophically. And uh, you need to have like uh, methods that are that are robust and they don't uh, build, for example, on some exclusive features that may be only uh, related to to the two to the two original data sets. Uh, so I this, think, yeah, yeah, the example yeah, with the work. Also, there was also a case like that, wasn't there, where the, I mean, the, was a, I mean, the AI uh, was really, really good at identifying patients who survived and patients who didn't. And that was because yeah, this is a, a, had been labels, so it, yeah. it learned to recognize the, the labels. It's a well-known problem with the healthcare data that uh, very often the methods don't generalize well, well to, to, to new settings. Uh, and th there was a very good example in a blog by Mike Jordan, where he talked about some machine that was to, used to to do a pregnancy test a test for pregnant women to see if there could be any problems in the in the baby and uh, because there was like a slight change in when, in how the data was collected uh, the the methods that were used to make predictions were not not accurate and they were uh, being completely confused by just the uh, noise uh, so you, you want to to get methods that are robust uh, uh, and they don't they don't fail catastrophically when there are small changes in the in the way the data is generated. Uh, somebody has asked whether the well the, the way they've put it is 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 the need for this kind of method a bit concealed at the moment. But I, I, I guess what they're saying is at the moment explainability isn't always something that's asked for, but as that becomes asked for, is is the need for this kind of method going to become more and more apparent as as people look at what they thought was quite a good predictive model and realize that it is picking up on these spurious correlations. Do you, yeah, do you so, see this becoming a much more a much more in demand technique? Yeah, so what is happening is that uh, deep learning and uh, neural networks are being used uh, more and more in uh, in problems that have like important uh, effects you know, in healthcare, in self driving cars, in the control of industrial systems, uh, in control of robotics. Uh, of robots. So if you have methods that uh, are not going to behave uh, as you expect uh, in, in new settings uh, that might be slightly different from the training data, then uh, things could go very wrong. And uh, you want to have methods that have some guarantees. I didn't go into the details uh, of this, but in, in these methods, uh, they actually have uh, theoretical guarantees in the sense that if we have enough uh, training data, even if it's only data from a single hospital, also, these methods they have guarantees that they will be able to to work well in uh, in uh, data from uh, new environments or from from different from a different hospital. Are, are you able to quantify the kind of performance improvements you would expect to see by using these methods instead of previous methods? I mean, we have these results. Uh, so, in the colored MNIST, obviously uh, the performance is uh, again is huge because just the uh, the test uh, data is completely anti-correlated. You know, the, the color is completely, if you have a classifier that uses the color for making predictions, at this time, it's going to make always the wrong prediction. Because at this time, the color is not really uh, useful for, for making predictions. The color is completely anti-correlated with the label. So that's an extreme case. And obviously, we have massive gains here. But we have seen the, the, the case with the image classifiers. You know? We were getting gains of about uh, 5% or so. Uh, so this is uh, with image data, uh, but uh, in other settings, uh, the gains could be even uh, larger. I mean, we have seen also the gains in the molecular optimization. In the molecular optimization problem, the gains are quite considered. Uh, quite yeah, that was, that was quite a striking graph. Uh, and yeah. um, finally, because again, although there are some more questions, we, we do have to wrap up. Uh, the pharma and the biotech sectors, I mean, obviously they could benefit a lot from that. How? How quickly are they adopting this? How sophisticated is their use of this kind of method? Yeah, so this is like a good question. Uh, right now, there is a lot of excitement about uh, using machine learning for uh, molecular design. This is uh, this is thought to be kind of a new area where deep learning is going to make like a, a huge, uh, to, to result in huge gains. So there's a lot of interest from people to come up with, with methods to come up with, to, with methods to, to find new molecules with improved properties. 
Uh, it's still at the beginning, uh, so these methods are not really robust or so, but uh, these techniques that we are developing, like the one that I have shown, uh, could be useful. Um, I have some, uh, I mean, this is also related to my Turing Fellowship. I have a Turing Fellowship, which is precisely on uh, machine learning for molecular design. And we are precisely working on, on this area, how to, how, to, how to do this. And uh, we have collaborations with, uh, with uh, pharmaceutical companies, for example. So everyone in pharma is now using uh, deep learning to, to improve the, the drug design process. And anyone in pharma or biotech who isn't should uh, get in touch with you right now at the Turing. <laughs> what, a, what a great note to end on. Thank you very much, Jose.